Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSPs, Ukraine War News Update, third part thereof, for the 10th of April 2024. Let's get straight to some geopoliticking. Uh, the EU has started preparing new sanctions against Russia, likely to be adopted soon. It will include restrictive measures focused on anti-circumvention in the maritime sector. So that's going to be, one would think, the $60 a barrel pri oil price cap. Uh, ships that are transporting oil that's more than that, so enforcing the sanctions in that way, as Russia continues to try and violate the price cap for its oil exports. Oh, I, I second guess myself. Right, okay. Just a little bit of analysis here from the Institute for the Study of War. Uh, in fact, actually, as we're going to move on to the US next, let's go to this first. So Zelensky met with, has met, he's meeting now with Lithuanian Minister of National Defence, Larinas Kaskiunas, quote or they've just done it sorry we discussed the importance of lithuania's continued develop uh, sorry leadership in the international coalition for demining the development of cooperation in the defense industry work on a document on security guarantees and further comprehensive support uh it's worth noting that this is the first foreign visit of laurinas in this position so the baltic nations such strong supporters of ukraine really important to keep those uh, cooperative relationships going institute for the study war moving towards discussing um information operations in the US escaping the Kremlin generated alternative reality requires more than evading Russian information operations the US must reconnect with its own interests and ground truths of this war uh there is this whole issue with information spaces being controlled or influenced by the Russians, and that is no more relevant than in the US. We will return to that idea. But anyway, the ISW says, one, the West has the advantage, but it must decide to use it. And this is the GDPs of NATO-led coalition supporting Ukraine versus GDPs of Russian-led coalition of autocratic states in trillions of US dollars. Um, so that is, I guess... Uh, is these that's Russia, Belarus, North Korea, Ch Iran, and China. So even with China uh, on board with um, with their GDP, the advantage is still with the NATO countries. I mean that that's really quite a significant stat there. Uh, the challenges facing the United States are easier to solve than those facing Russia. That's a really important note to take uh, to take it on board. The gap that Ukraine and its partners need to close that to help Ukraine win is smaller than the gap that Russia needs to close to achieve its objectives in Ukraine. Uh, three, uh, the West is not as fragile as Russia wants us to think. Minimizing the West's perception of its own strength is a core component of the Kremlin's perception manipulation. So they make us think we are more fragile than we really are. And I'm, I'm, I guess, victim of that. I think Europe is very fragile at the moment. And I don't know if that's because that idea has been put there by Russian disinformation or whether I just recognise the fragility of democracy in general, how easy it is to democratically backslide. I look to, uh, for example, Hungary to see example of that. Uh, I even look to the United States and see how there's been some democratic black backsliding um, in the last sort of seven years. And, and that's worrying. And I just think we take for granted how fragile our own mechanisms and institutions are. Uh, number, four, uh, number four, the ebbs and flows of the battlefield in Ukraine are irrelevant to the fundamental US interests at stake. Any outcome short of Ukraine liberating its critical territory will likely lead to a larger war with higher escalation risks for the US under conditions that favour Russia. Massively important point that. Uh, five, the, re the West is awakening. Many Western leaders and societies have awakened to the reality that there is no going back to the status quo, anti, uh, uh, that Russia is a self-declared adversary and that the West has two choices, counter the threat or surrender to it. This is what depresses me at the moment is that there are people in, in the US, for example, who do, don't think that the that Russia is the enemy, the adversary, that, that they'd rather vote for Putin and for Biden. I know that might be a, a very small proportion of the population, but there's there's some kind of version of that, some manifestation of that in very key positions in Congress. And indeed, I think with Trump. And I think that's insanely dangerous at the moment and really, really worrying. Uh, six, Western advantage is not a permanent condition. However, the erosion of the West's capability to counter the Russian threat that will be proportionate to the delays in the Western realisation of the threat itself. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we we are we are only as good as the recognition 
that we have an adversary and that we need to do something about it and that 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 political will the cost of failure number seven in ukraine could would be catastrophic the threat of a nuclear escalation will continue to be the core asset of russia's perception manipulation at the same time the risk of russia nato war increases exponentially if russia keeps its gains in ukraine imagine that i've said this before imagine if nuclear weapons didn't exist this war would be over by now we would have absolutely made mincemeat of russia if nuclear warfare was not what was petrifying people into anti-escalation uh, policies then i tell you what yeah russia would have been absolutely crushed but I guess as a, we wouldn't have even had the Cold War had that, had they not existed. So, yeah. Um, number eight, the upside is high. Ukraine's victory would enhance NATO security. Ukraine would emerge an invaluable asset uh, for the United States and a testament to the values underpinning Western societies. Nine, the US must restore its strategic clarity and get the big idea right. The best course for US interests is support to support Ukraine to its victory as the only path to a durable peace rather than a temporary respite and then help Ukraine rebuild putting the largest combat effective friendly military in Europe at the forefront of NATO's defence. Interesting. Agreed. Okay, Cameron went across to the US yesterday and he spoke to Trump. Some people finding that controversial. Greg Terry on the live stream last night thought it was uh, not a good idea. Um but he also met with Anthony Blinken and they had a, a joint pref press conference together. I come here with no intention to lecture anybody. And that's the right approach. He's, it's not about lecturing Trump. I don't think it was going to work with Trump at all. But it's about at least trying and having the right optics for other people. Lord Cameron gives a news conference with US Secretary of State Anthony Blinken in Washington. Let's uh, listen in. Britain is taking action to source more ammunition for them uh, in the run up to that. We know that they need support from NATO allies and a good outcome to the NATO summit, which we were discussing this morning. And we know that they need money in the form of the frozen Russian sovereign assets. And we're making good progress in how to access that funds on an agreed basis that I think we can take forward at the G7. And of course, in terms of the money they need and the support they need, perhaps nothing is more important than the supplemental that the Congress is looking at at the moment. And I come here with um, no intention to lecture anybody or tell anybody what to do or get in the way of the process of politics and other things in the United States. I just come here as a great friend and believer of, in this country and a believer that it's profoundly in your interests uh, and your security and your future and the future of all your partners to release this money and, and let it through. And I'm looking forward to meetings I'm going to ha be having in Congress um, later today. Um, so I was just trying to sort some out there. I thought that was an interesting uh, statement there from Cameron, trying to really carefully navigate that fine line between uh, seeking to advise people in the US to, towards a correct uh, course of action and seeing to being seen to lecture them and I don't think it was ever going to work with Trump uh, I guess the jury's out as to whether it was ever going to be a good idea or not to even try that as you can see pre in this previous tweet here below here Anthony Davis saying huge naivety on behalf of David Cameron and the British meeting Trump for talks just goes to normalize an authoritarian who will say anything to anyone you cannot negotiate with terrorists <laughs> so that's someone who's deeply anti-Trump saying you shouldn't have done that but then you'll have pro MAGA people like Marjorie Taylor Greene who have come out and said you shouldn't have done that type thing uh indeed in this Guardian piece here David Cameron seemingly fails to bid to persuade Trump on Ukraine aid we can uh, we can see that in a response from Taylor Greene we'll we'll come on to that at a joint press conference in Washington on Tuesday Cameron and the U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken repeated their long-standing appeals to Congress to unblock the assistance Cameron insisted he had not come to the U.S. to lecture or anyone or interfere with internal American politics but said he was prepared to drop the Diplo speak because he felt emo so emotional about the need for the U.S. and Europe to to stand together to defend Ukraine against Russian aggression. He warned, quote, future generations may look back at us and say, did we do enough when this country was invaded by a dictator trying to redraw boundaries by force? Did we learn the lessons from history? And did we do enough? 
but Cameron's arguments, both rational and emotional, seem to have run up against the continued power struggle inside the Republican Party as hardliners who have cooled on continuing to support Ukraine financially threaten to oust Johnson if he puts the aid package to a vote when Congress returns from its two-week vacation. Quote, this has been a complete and total surrender to, if not complete and total lockstep with, the Democrats' agenda that has angered our Republican base so much and given them very little reason to vote for a Republican House majority, Marjorie Taylor Greene wrote in a fresh attack on Johnson. Now, what annoys me about that is that her base listen to what she says. They don't wake up in the morning and have anger about Ukraine aid. They need to be told that Ukraine aid is either good or bad. The, my job here, as I see it, is to communicate to, to everyone that is willing to listen that Ukraine aid is good and it's in the best interest of the US, of Europe, of the UK, uh, the EU, UK, to, to do this, to help Ukraine and to help as much as possible. And so I am informing other people's minds and opinions about this, right? So Marjorie Taylor Greene does that to her base. So when she says her base are angry, they are angry precisely because she's told them to be angry about this and, and then claims that she's reflecting the base. That is really disingenuous. I do not like that. Um, uh, but that is precisely what's happening. Uh, and then she's the one that, that's making it be a, a partisan thing. And so therefore, when someone comes out to to advise the US on on um, supporting Ukraine, it's, oh, look at them, they're being in lockstep with the Democrats. No, you have said this is a Democrats thing. The Democrats never said that. They were trying to help Ukraine. You drove the wedge in there and made it partisan. So it's not so much as being lockstep with the Democrats, it's being in unlockstep with MAGA Republicans. That's, the, that's what's going on here. Um, so it, it is really, uh, really problematic when this anti-Ukraine uh, sentiment is infused through uh, what looks like the Republican Party on a, on a grown basis. I didn't report this the other day because I w wasn't sure that this was actually... I thought this was just a, a vocal misstep. I thought he had, he had just misspoken such that he had just got Ukraine and Russia mixed up, as I sometimes do. I often do that. But I think this was intentional, and most analysis uh, analyses seem to think that as well. So this is the RNC, the R Republican National Committee Chair, Michael Watley, saying the quiet part out loud on Maria Bartiromo's show that portrays Ukraine as an aggressive adversary of the US. This is massively depressing. Look, I think that we are seeing right now that this election truly, truly matters on national security, on every one of these issues. When America is weak, the world is a far more dangerous place. And right now, Joe Biden's feckless leadership has shown China has shown Ukraine, has shown Iran that they can feel free to be much more aggressive on the world front to the point where even they will try and, and meddle with our elections here. And I think that is is purposeful because there was this theory that was a de it's a debunked pro-Russian theory that got into Republican minds earlier on that it wasn't the Russians that interfered in the 2016-2020 election. It was the, the Ukrainians that did, uh, which has been, you know, soundly, roundly debunked. Anyway, you know, Newsweek reporting Trump's RNC chair includes Ukraine in a list of US adversaries. So Ukraine are now the enemy. Like, what is going on? Like, these people should be challenged. What is Maria Bartiromo doing? She's an irresponsible journalist because she's not a journalist. She's just a mouthpiece for the MAGA. And it's just so dangerous. It's so, so dangerous. Uh, and then we have retired military officials issuing grave warnings about Trump's claim to absolute immunity. Uh, I just think is is all going wrong. It's all going Pete Tong in, in US politics. I was wondering about including this because there is so much I could talk about with regard to Trump's legal issues and woes and the situation going on with many of them. But they don't really pertain to Ukraine. But this one kind of does. This is about... Uh, it's about national security, really. So one of the ways he's trying to delay uh, all of these trials is to say that uh, he's immune because he's a president. He's immune uh, to to law, <laughs> essentially. Uh, and he's really 
advocating that a president, and he said this fairly explicitly, that a president should be able to do whatever the hell they like, including kind of like assassinating people, maybe his political rival, uh, and just get away with it because he's a president. Anyway, there have been 19 retired four-star generals and admirals and former secretaries of the Army, Navy and Air Force that have filed a brief with the Supreme Court on Monday to say that this is freaking dangerous. <laughs> that his claim for absolute immunity from criminal prosecution is an assault on the military's foundational commitments to the rule of law and civilian control. So what they're saying is basically, it, it, th he may feel like he would have immunity, but if he's then uh, asking th the f anyone else to do what he wants, that he wants to be immune from, those other people aren't necessarily going to be immune. So if, if he's asking the uh, the army to go and assassinate someone, for example, and says, hey, I've got presidential immunity. Well, actually, the, does the army have presidential immunity? Do those commanders, do those snipers or whatever? So it's all just is like this is just this is just a whole load of wrong. Um uh, so anyway, there's just so many crazy things going on in American politics at the moment. Uh, and here we have, um, well, uh, I'll, I'll, leave it, I'll leave it to you to listen, actually, and then I'll comment it af on it afterwards. Like China, Russia continues to target critical infrastructure, including things like underwater cables and industrial control systems, both in the United States and around the world. And since its unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, we've seen Russia conducting reconnaissance on the U.S. energy sector. Now, adding to that concern is that the Russians, like our other adversaries, don't care if their cyber campaigns affect civilians. You can just look back at what happened in 2017. Like China... So, right, this is, this is our way into the next point of this. So... Not recognising that Russia are the adversaries is absolutely dangerous. And it's dangerous because people are forgetting, A, what, what Russia has done previously, uh, and we can include China here, and we'll go on to that, and, and B, what they are doing. So that if, if you are giving them free reign to do X, Y, and Z, then you are allowing them to... Uh, to undermine national security. This is a huge, huge problem. And this is the FBI director saying that they are cutting undersea cables, they're doing reconnaissance on the US security, uh, energy sector, uh, and yet you've got the RNC uh, and you've got Marjorie Taylor Greene saying Ukraine are the corrupt uh, enemy here, uh, Russia, are the, Russia are right, and you've got... Uh, you've got Republican voters saying, I'd rather vote for Putin. Putin is actively undermining US security. I'd rather vote for Putin than Biden. Biden's not doing that. Jesus wept. Anyway, it, here we have Adam Kinzinger on uh, The Bulwark, which is a conservative podcast, talking to Tim Miller here. This is a phenomenally interesting interview, and I suggest all of you go and watch the whole thing. This is really very good, but I'm going to play you this part in the middle. It's a bit kind of ranty in this part, but my goodness, it's important to hear this. Really, really important to hear this. Yeah. That said... D this idea that Donald Trump was any sorry, I need to give you context. So what's just been decided, what's just been discussed, is that he was saying Joe Biden gets a sort of B minus C plus for foreign po policy diplomacy. He's like he's doing all right for foreign diplomacy wise, but it could be better. And here it could have been better. There it could have been better. There, but he's saying, but he's going to go on to say, but the idea that like you've got to realize really what Donald Trump was like and I was in the room is what Adam Kinzinger was saying that said d this idea that Donald Trump was any good on foreign policy is garbage he was the weakest president he's evil and weak you know everybody will say yeah. to me well Russia never would have invaded Ukraine if Trump was president. Okay, maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. We have no way of knowing. But it wouldn't have been because they were scared of American response to an invasion. It's because he wouldn't have needed to invade because Vladimir Putin was getting everything he wanted anyway. Right. The only thing Trump did that was worth praising, and it is worth praising, is killing Soleimani. That was Mike Pompeo's decision. But guess what? Trump gets credit for that. And the Democrats get a bad on him because they were screaming about World War III. But like 
Remember when they shot down that giant drone that was $300 million and we did nothing? Remember when they hit the Saudi oil field and we did nothing? Remember when they bombed U.S. troops and we did nothing? Remember when Donald Trump stood by Vladimir Putin and said he believes him over his own intelligence agencies? I was in the Oval Office with Donald Trump when he said that President Xi asked him for a little favor and could we do it, which was to take Chinese telecom ZTE out of the sanctions list because he asked him a personal favor. ZTE, which is spying on the United States. Donald Trump was the worst, Tim, the worst foreign policy president, not even about his personality, about his just actions. And this is what concerns me is there's this like... So this idea that that Trump's going to be strong with Ukraine is like you've got Adam Kinzinger, a former Republican lawmaker, saying, I was in the room when Trump asked if he could do a favour for Xi Jinping because he had just asked him to. There's no like... There's no conceptual understanding of like what the ramifications that will be and why he might ask that. Like, just blows my mind. And this is why you get the 40 out of 44 of Donald Trump's previous administration have not backed him for president. He is freaking dangerous, right? And uh, I, I can't tell you how worried I am if, if people are going to vote for him en masse in November with regard to international diplomacy and what's going to go on with Ukraine. You've got, you know, as I say, Adam Kinzinger was in the room when that happened. And he, he's like, I've learned my lesson. He is a very, he was terrible in, for international diplomacy. And I've long maintained that. I wrote an article way back when about him leaving the Kurds to dry, hanging them out to dry. And how terrible that was, like, one of the worst terrible uh, foreign diplomacy moments, m one of the worst moments of the Trump uh, uh, presidency. And also, that he mentions that Helsinki press conference, I think, was absolutely egregious. Blessed memory of Donald Trump's foreign policy and economic policy. He was a friggin' disaster. That's a great rant. And I'll add to it, I'm reading David Sanger's books. We're going to have him on the pod. This is uh, so important. In the next few weeks. And um, I had forgotten because it happened right before January 6th and it got washed away kind of in just the news craziness. Do you remember the solar winds attack? The the uh, the um, cyber attack? Yes! On the I government? forgot all about like, that. We, yeah, yes. exactly. Me too. I'm reading the book and I was like, oh, right. There was a cyber. Yeah. Russia c committed a cyber attack on our government. A very serious one. Very. Uh, where we lost a lot of uh, you know, a lot of uh, government workers' private information, you know, a, a, a high level cyber attack, not one of these like random ones um, that penetrated uh, the federal government. Trump puts out a tweet that's like, ah, maybe it's the Chinese. The fake news always say Russia, 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 right? It's like Trump is like running, doing propaganda for the people that literally are attacking our government, and it just kind of got washed away because the next day the Capitol got stormed. Just, just think about that. The Russians do a massive, massive cyber attack, and and as as I mentioned, it got washed away because the next day or soon after January the sixth happened, and everyone forgot about that. But the U.S. government was attacked, which, in my opinion, is functionally the same as warfare. Was attacked by Russia, and the president comes out and says, "Well, maybe it was China," because he's so indebted to Russia. They've got something on in some kind of compromise. I don't know, but he is consistently batting for China. And then when Marjorie Taylor Greene comes out and bats for China, you're like, uh, "Sorry, batting for Russia." And Marjorie Taylor Greene comes out and bats for Russia. You're thinking. There's something going on here. And by the way, I, I, so I don't know what's been declassified. I got the classified briefing of it, so I'll have to speak kind of high level. Yeah. It was not just – SolarWinds was not a one-time intrusion hack. This was an infection that at least at the time I was in, and then, of course, I got sidetracked with all the January 6th stuff. The government was talking about like gajillions of dollars of damage to actual government infrastructure – I'm sure they've been going after it now, but this, I'm glad you brought that up. I forgot all about that. And that was like, like made Edward Snowden look like a kitty cat type devastating right. stuff to the U.S. government. And Donald Trump, what does he do? I mean, look, the Havana syndrome story that just came out. What is MAGA doing? They're calling it a ray. Oh, Russia has a ray gun. Sure. Yeah. You're always going after Russia. Russia is cooking the brains of American government workers 
with microwave directed microwave energy, which we've known for decades exists and can exist. So it's not a magic ray gun on a sci-fi film. And MAGA is out there defending Russia and pretending like we're making the whole thing up. Because the MAGA narrative is the Russian narrative. Screw them. Period. All right. Neocon power, ca- power hour is over mm-hmm. for now. Let's talk. Uh, Thank you. Let's do a little. Honestly, like. The frustration Adam Kinzinger have, has, that, and I think he's a decent human who has a good hand. He's a veteran. He knows he in this interview, he says Ukraine is a single most important thing. Like this is the inflection point. He's exactly like on par with what many of uh, well, what I believe and what, what many of you think. I, I'll, I'll have to dig out that part. In fact, I'll probably do that right now because I think it's that important. So here it is, is Adam Kinzinger talking about how difficult it is for people like Mike Gallagher to come out and speak. They've resigned instead of actually going against uh, the movement of the MAGA movement of the Republican Party. And he says that they actually should have done that. And Tim Miller's very strong on that, saying rather than resign uh, and give up the ability to do that, they, they should be going to the floor and making the case. However... Adam Kinzinger later says they do that for financial reasons. So if you annoy all these people, then when you do re- resign because you can't handle it all, they are the people that are in all the, the employers who are going to employ you to lobby or whatever need you to have purchase with those very people. And so therefore it was a, it was very much a financial decision for people like Ken Buck and, and Mike Gallagher to step down without challenging. Really? And so like, yeah, I, I, but I stay in touch with most of them. I mean, I think it's it's an understanding that, look, I get it from their perspective. I don't agree. I understand how hard it is to speak out. Yeah. Um, but like, for God's sakes, this is, I, this is just such a moment in history. And I'm not saying this is like just to make a good podcast. Like, I really believe that this is what, like in my lifetime, this is the most important thing that we have ever dealt with. And uh, the, this and I guess- big the ukraine russia war yeah, or just yeah. the democratic threat or the whole the whole kit i think it's it. all of it but I, yeah. I guess in this context it's ukraine it's the russian interference it's the division in the country it's like the most important moment and like these guys could get statues in kiev built to them they real literally could get nice. you know mike mccall avenue in downtown kiev right. and and they just can't do it i don't know so i look for goodness sake adam kinzinger to me would be and I'm no Republican fan, but that's the, you know to me that's who that's what Republicans should be. Republicanism should be standing for that kind of strength in national security that it used to stand for, but it seems to have been lost of, of late. And it started well, it didn't start. It, it it is it is at the moment manifesting itself in what Marjorie Taylor Greene is doing in holding Mike Johnson uh, to ransom uh, with the threat of vacating his seat. Uh, here we have, uh, quote, America's moment of truth on Ukraine by the always perspicacious uh, Edward Luce. Um, the Quote, the Republican right treats Ukraine as an enemy and Russia as a friend, defining that stance as isolationist is lazy and wrong. It's actively pro-Russian. And you know what? Uh, Mike Johnson in, is in his position because Kevin McCarthy was ousted. Kevin McCarthy was ousted. Why? I mean, wow, this is just absolutely fascinating. Uh, he admits, uh, I won't play you the whole two minutes here for, from this C-SPAN video, but Kevin McCarthy on Matt Gates, who, who vacated his seat, was behind that move to get him ousted. Uh, I'll give you the truth why I'm not speaker, says Kevin, Kevin McCarthy. It's because one person, a member of Congress, wanted me to stop an ethics complaint because he slept with a 17-year-old. Did he or did he not? I don't know. But there's this ethics um, uh, investigation, ethics complaint into Matt Gates, and Kevin McCarthy was was behind that, as in he was he was on board with that taking place. Matt Gates didn't want that to take place, didn't want to be investigated for sleeping with a 17 year old, and as a result, Kevin McCarthy got ousted. I mean, it's just oh, and 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 as a result, we've got Mike Johnson in who's being manipulated by. Um, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is perpetuating the Russian narrative, and it's all just oh, what is happening? Why is why is fairness and and rightness and justice not prevailing here? Why are the checks and balances not working? Why can so few people have so much power 
to prom propagate and promulgate the Russian propaganda narratives is so, so infuriating. And Zelensky has now got to the point where I think he's desperate and just infuriated by the whole situation. He said, if Trump's idea to stop war is to give up our territory, then it is primitive. Zelensky said in an interview with the Bild, the German uh, tabloid newspaper, that he is sceptical about US President Trump's alleged peace plan on ceding part of occupied Ukrainian territories to Russia. Quote, if the deal and the idea is simply to give our territories, then it is very primitive, he said. Ukraine's president also stressed that he would be very happy to listen to Trump's approach to ending the war quickly if the former president actually had it. So he's becoming much more emboldened to say these things, but I guess it's like... I, I guess that the Ukrainians have probably realised that they ain't going to get any help in November 2024 if, if Trump's in charge. And so therefore, he's just got to, he's just like throwing caution to the wind and saying, this is how desperate we are. We are this is where we're at. Uh, look, it, 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 this is what you say, Trump. Prove it. Put your money where your mouth is. Uh, look, if you guys are, are as upset as I am about what's going on in Congress, there is a tool you can use. I can't do it. I, I, I'm British. But call on congress.us is a tool that you can use uh, to to get um, to get help for Ukraine. In fact, if you do call on congress.us forward slash Ukraine, then this this tool will help you direct your uh, advice to con Congress people uh, with regard to Ukraine aid. So please do use that. www.callongcongress.us forward slash Ukraine. Um, uh, elsewhere in the in the larger region, you've got Georgia seeing more uh, protests as a result of their government getting closer and closer to Putin and Russia. It's great to see them on force with on mass with Georgian and EU flags this is all about trying to embrace western pro democratic I <laughs> ideals good stuff and indeed there so this is i think it, as a result of their the Georgian dream ruling party trying to change the rules on democratic um, on on voting uh, with regard to foreign interference or foreign money coming in. Now, on the one hand, you could see that as being um, pro-democratic. So we don't want foreign interference. So we're going to shut down foreign money coming in to interfere with our democracy. But actually, it's not quite that. It, it's to do with g keeping an iron grip on um, on the voting mechanisms. And it's exactly what... Uh, has happened elsewhere where Russia have tried to uh, have an uh, have more of an iron grip on the democratic outcomes in places like I think Hungary have had a similar law foreign agents law is called uh, but anyway the, that there are so many people coming out on the streets against this is good news for Georgia and good news for democracy in in the wider region um, on the other hand just down the road in Armenia uh, RSW reports that uh, their, the Armenian sovereignty is being challenged in the capital Yerevan as the Russians have openly just arrested someone like the Russians in another country in Armenia. So, uh, yeah, Russia challenges Yerevan sovereignty by detaining Russian citizen in Armenia. Uh, Russian military authorities detained Russian citizen Anatoly uh, Shetin in Armenia for allegedly avoiding the military draft. The Institute for the Study of Wars report said, citing the International Human Rights Organization, Helsinki Citizens Assembly in Vanadzor, uh, the detention may have been part of an effort to assert military and political power over Armenia and to challenge Armenia's sovereignty amid a continued deterioration of the state's relations, the report said. Um, and then... Uh, in kind of connected news because Moldova is a similar sort of country in many respects ambassador so uh, the ambassador to Moldova saying the EU is to provide lethal aid to Moldova that's lethal aid so it plans to provide lethal aid military aid to Moldova 
Um, whereas previously, so quite in the past, our support has been non-lethal equipment. So it has been about demining, about hospitals, about communications equipment, about vehicles. But this year, there is a plan to also have lethal components. Wow. Uh, so it's hotting up in Moldova. And there's also, there's lots to be said. I haven't reported it today, but the... Um, the other region, not Transnistria, but, but Galgazia, the, the woman who's in charge of that region, well, the Russian sort of proxy, is getting very close to Putin and and it's looking like they, there's lots of disunity being fermented in, in Moldova by the Russians. And then lastly, this is not good news, Brazil seems to be going in the wrong direction with Lula da Silva. Uh, I, was, I had high hopes for him to be a lot better than Bolsonaro. I'm not a fan of Bolsonaro. He's an authoritarian quasi dictator was on the way to being one and if it wasn't for US intervention there would have been a coup after his it was a rulership as we've now found out uh so I thought it was excellent that De Silva got in instead of him but then De Silva seems to be making some bad decisions here so new figures show Brazil under Lula De Silva has increased its imports of Russian diesel by more than 6,000% since he became president in January 2023. Imported 102,000 tonnes of fuel under Bolsonaro. Uh, in 2023, it's increased to 6.1 million tonnes. It does seem that, that there's... Uh, De Lula's is, is a bit confusing over exactly where he stands with Putin. Uh, sometimes you think, yep, that's the right thing. You said the right thing. And other times you're like, no, that's completely wrong. So I don't know. And maybe that... that belies a sort of complication with being in BRICS, with being kind of anti-US imperialism from his personal point of view, uh, but also re recognising that, that <laughs> Russia's uh, maybe worse in in those respects. And so therefore, ah, you know, and so therefore he does some things, but then other things not. But I, I don't know. I, I get the sense that Brazil's moving in the wrong direction there. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe and share. Really appreciate your support. Uh, I, I do, as I keep having to say, I do spend a lot of time on American politics because, you know, Zelensky said, if it's not for American aid, we're going to lose the war. So he's saying how important American aid is. And so I think it's incumbent upon me to report the difficulties in the US getting aid and what's it going to look like going forward with regard to continued US support politically for uh, Ukraine. And I'm absolutely adamant that that a Trump presidency will screw screw Ukraine over. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind. And that's why I am being much more open in my advocacy for a non-Trump presidency uh, in the US. Uh, it's a shame that Haley wasn't there for, for the Republicans. Uh, the question is, what do non-Trump Republicans do? Do they hold their nose and vote Biden? I would strongly advocate that, but I recognise that many of you Republicans out there hate Biden, which is interesting because Biden isn't like divisive. He's quite inclusive. He's The economy is doing well. It's just... If you get take yourself out of Republican media spaces, actually Biden's infrastructure bill was huge. The first two years he got stuff done. The the this session of Congress, the last two years, nothing's getting done because of the Republicans, not the not the Democrats. So I don't know. I I think there is a case to being fair to Biden to say actually, you know that he's got a he's got a fairly decent track record compared to I I would guess the previous administration, but. I know many of you will disagree with me for sure on that. Um, yeah. Anyway, thanks for watching. Take care. Speak soon.